Good morning. I'm Sandy Gomp. I'm the Chief of Infectious Disease here at the VA and we're going to talk a little bit about foodborne illnesses. We have a little bit of an abbreviated uh, talk. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. slides are coming up a little bit slow. Um, what I'm going to cover today is in the way I uh, generally approach GI syndromes, ac generally acute GI syndromes for the most part. And I like to break it down into syndromes so that we can sort of pinpoint the more likely organisms that are uh, causing uh, infection. So the first, uh, there's four general. Uh, one, gastroenteritis, two, enterocolitis or colitis, three, the collar-like ones, and uh, dysentery. And today we're going to look at uh, gastroenteritis and enteritis um, because we're a little bit short on time. We'll cover the, the rest on another occasion. So generally, gastroenteritis uh, is uh, predominantly upper GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, uh, a little bit of cramps and diarrhea with some of them. They're acute in onset and short in duration, uh, generally self-limited, and patients tend to be afebrile. There's fever is not a prominent issue. The enteritis or colitis syndromes generally don't have any upper sim symptoms. They're more uh, lower abdominal cramping and diarrhea. Fever may occur. The cholera-like syndromes are uh, pathogens that cause large volumes of watery stool, and the classic cholera is causes a rice water stool, um, and there may or may not be fever involved. And then there's the dysenteries, which cause frequent small volumes of stool uh, with blood and mucus, and frequently cause tenesmus, which is the sensation of having to have a bowel movement but not being able to, uh, sort of a rectal spasm, and they may or may not have fever. So gastroenteritis, uh, for the most part, is caused by a preformed toxin that's ingested uh, in the food and drink. It's already there. It's not produced after it's ingested. Um, it's caused by the growth of bacteria and, and release of toxin into the food. Incubation period for gastroenteritis tends to be very short, uh, up to six hours, but may occur within the hour. Uh, the duration usually short, very less than 12 hours, uh, usually at the most, less than a day, and fever is very uncommon. The classic, uh, uh, the prototype of food poisoning or gastroenteritis is Staph aureus, uh, and it's most associated with poorly refrigerated dairy products, any creamy type of foods, custards, um, fillings, pastries with cream fillings, egg salad, mayonnaise, that sort of thing, uh, tends to be a great place for Staph aureus to grow at the right temperatures. And it's characterized by severe nausea and vomiting. Maybe a little bit of diarrhea later on. Um, you feel miserable. And the classic situation is it happens right after a picnic because you have all this mayo and, and things sitting out for a while. Uh, the toxin is heat stable, so if you reheat it, for example, you have something that, need, that you need to reheat, that's not going to destroy the toxin. Uh, the diagnosis, for the most part, is clinical. You're, most people get over this by the time they get to a physician, and the scenario is so classic that you don't really need to do a culture of stool or food. But if you were looking, for example, in an outbreak situation, um, that might be something that would that would be done just to confirm the cause of, of the problem. Uh, if you were to do a stool gram stain, you would see a lot of white cells and a lot of gram-positive cocci um, just as things move on through. And the treatment is uh, supportive measures. A, you, this, the stuff just has to get, get out. Either you have to vomit it up or it has to go the other way. But um, as once the toxin is gone, things resolve. 
Uh, secondly, you can have Bacillus cereus, which really causes a very similar syndrome, um, but is more likely to be associated with unrefrigerated, boiled, or fried rice. So Chinese restaurant syndrome, uh, another version of Chinese restaurant syndrome besides the MSG. Um, and usually, if, if you actually were to go to do a culture, uh, it, a Bacillus is a gram-positive um, a gram, um positive rod that uh, is otherwise uh, generally a contaminant, so you might have to notify the lab that you're actually wanting a culture. They might dismiss it. But you're really usually not going to do that. You're not going to do a culture. Um, I put botulism in here uh, because really it's, it's a toxin-mediated pathogen. It doesn't really fit into the gastroenteritis. It doesn't really fit into the other ones either. But this was the best place to put it, so we'll talk about it here. Um, Clostridium botulinum produces both an endotoxin and a neurotoxin. Uh, the neurotoxin is what makes it unique. Uh, the incubation period is uh, half a day to a little bit over uh, a day, and then you develop cramps, blurry vision, uh, often a constipation uh, or an ileus. Uh, fever is not common. And it's associated with home canned foods and proper canning techniques and uh, raw honey uh, and unpasteurized honey. It is a, also a preformed toxin that may be found in the stool or food. And the treatment is, again, to get rid of the toxin. Purge the GI tract, unless the, the patient has an ileus, paralytic ileus. Uh, you can also uh, request antitoxin from the CDC. Uh, the characteristics, uh, the thing to remember, uh, especially for board purposes, uh, is neonatal botulism. And most parents know this. You don't give honey to an infant because honey can contain spores of botulism. Uh, in the third world, um, there you can have umbilical cord contamination after birth, and that can be a source of neonatal botulism. Uh, the characteristics of neonatal botulism are a weak suck or poor feeding uh, because the muscles are, are being affected, causing weakness. Uh, weak respiratory muscles and respiratory failure, that's the, the main risk, and you can, the baby can be floppy as well. The neurotoxin essentially causes uh, uh, extreme relaxation or paralysis of, of muscle. And that's also why you see the blurry vision um, and the paralytic ileus or constipation. Yeah. Right. That one is probably somewhere in this section. Um, so moving, th that's pretty a very characteristic scenario with uh, acute gastroenteritis. So the two pathogens that you should remember are going to be the Staph aureus and Bacillus cereus. Staph aureus can be the most common one. The group uh, with enteritis or colitis has contains the largest number of possible pathogens. It's going to be the, the the majority of the diarrheal syndromes that you'll see. Uh, over 90% of the non-bacterial causes of enteritis are norovirus or rotavirus. Uh, children get these a lot. Nursing home residents get these a lot. These are the outbreaks that you hear about on the cruise ships periodically. They tend to be associated with cool weather. Parasites can cause enteritis and colitis. They tend to be more chronic and don't come in with a with fulminant uh, 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 symptoms. And enteritis uh, and colitis are characterized by non-bloody diarrhea. That's the majority of the symptoms. Uh, what tends to help uh, when you're trying to determine which pathogens are involved is to focus on a history. Uh, if your patient presents with less than six watery stools a day, maybe a little bit of fever, and they've been sick for less than a week, it's most likely viral, um, more likely than bacterial, uh, unless they're a traveler, if they have a travel history that, that tips you over into a different dif differential. Most of the time, uh, folks aren't going to come in to see you. By the time they come in to see you, get your, their appointment, they're going to be fine. So those are handled uh, generally with self-care, symptomatic treatment. 
if uh, the patient's not been has a under six uh, watery stools a day and they've been sick for longer than a week then you start thinking of things like parasites that's where you start thinking of doing stool um, open parasites and cultures and that sort of thing if they're having more than six watery stools and remember we're talking watery stools not loose stools you have to differentiate uh, with your patient what they're talking about when they're si saying diarrhea if they tend to be constipated and now their stools are loose but not but they still have a little bit of form to them that's not necessarily diarrhea so just differentiate uh, if they have a temperature uh, over 101 they don't have blood they may have uh, white cells in the stool and they've been sick for less than a week so significant diarrhea they're sick they got a fever um, if they're in the community you might think of things like salmonella and campylobacter if they're in healthcare you're more likely to think of clostridium difficile first off which uh, very often uh, one of the big clues is a leukocytosis unexplained leukocytosis uh, if it's been longer than a week, again, you're going to think of more chronic things, parasites, crypto, uh, cyclosporia, giardiasis, and you're going to explore those histories further. Right, and Dr. Green mentions that there is an increasing um, uh, reporting of community-acquired Clostridium difficile, so that's something that, that bears watching in the future, um, bears awareness, uh, not necessarily associated with antibiotic use or health care. So the, I'm going to talk a little bit now about Salmonella. Uh, the bact generally, the, ba the major bacterial causes of enteritis uh, of uh, concern are Salmonella, Enterotoxigenic E. coli, Clostridium perfringens, Campylobacter jejuni, and Vibrio cholera, or the Vibrios. And I have time to talk a little bit about Salmonella, so let's go there. And if you remember, the la there have been several reports over the last several years of baby turtles being a problem you'll be driving down uh, highway 60 and you'll see the guy with the back of the truck open and they're selling turtles now that's illegal uh, the reason that it's illegal is that baby turtles are associated with salmonellosis they're the way um, they're raised is in large groups and they there's a lot of feces and water and they spread salmonella salmonella is very difficult to get rid of in the environment like a lot of the, the gram negatives so um, that their problem the loophole that they use if you if you stop is that they'll have a little sign up that says for educational purposes only there, there's a loophole in the law that says that schools, teachers, any educational and scientific use, you can buy turtles. Otherwise, if you're just a parent looking for a pet, um, you're not supposed to buy them. Salmonella enteritis is characterized by fevers, cramps, diarrhea, some nausea. Um, the incubation period is one to two days, and it's most associated with undercooked poultry, meat, or eggs. Um, now, the way uh, poultry is raised in general is the, the factory farms. Um, the, you have rows and rows of ca open cages and chickens that are stuffed into basically little cages all stacked together. On top, and then there's also rows on the bottom. So there's poop everywhere and there's a lot of con cross-contamination and there's no way to avoid um, uh, pathogens being transmitted from between chickens uh, and you know that in birds their intestinal tract and their reproductive tract are connected they come out together uh, and they open a, to one uh, common opening called the cloaca and so the eggs and the intestinal tract pretty much meet there and there's cross-contamination between there if the the birds have salmonella in their GI tract then the eggs are actually forming with salmonella in them so it's not, not just on the surface of the eggs it's in the eggs themselves 
So if you have any sort of concern uh, about immunosuppression, you should well cook your eggs as well as your chicken. So that's the story with, with poultry and eggs. Reptiles um, are a risk factor for salmonellosis, uh, especially the baby turtles, which are well known, but also pretty much any reptile, snakes, lizards, uh, anything raised uh, in uh, by these mass uh, breeders uh, can be contaminated with or chronically colonized with salmonella, uh, but also increasingly guinea pigs, dogs, yeah, all sorts of pets that are raised in, in, in the pet industry can be a risk. So, you know, general uh, common sense precautions apply, but reptiles in particular. Repti home children, especially young children or immunosuppressed people, have become very seriously ill or, or developed disseminated disease just from being in a house where a snake was owned or a lizard or some sort of reptile, even if they don't handle it. Because when you, again, salmonella is hard to get rid of in the environment. If you're cleaning the cage, you don't, you don't necessarily know a whole lot about keeping sterile and washing hands real quickly. You're going to start touching things around the environment and it just spreads. So anyway, um, you, if you do stools, it'll be positive uh, for stool leukocytes. The culture will be positive. Uh, no, again, know that salmonella can cause disseminated disease, including meningitis, intra-abdominal uh, infections, septic joints, lung abscesses. Those things are much more likely in the very young, under one, in the elderly, uh, anyone pretty much over 50, but the older you get, of course, immun immunity goes down. Anyone who's immunosuppressed, HIV, steroids, asplenia, People with vascular grafts and prosthetic joints are at risk for hematogenous infection of those devices, and sickle cell patients. Uh, there's a, the classic scenario is salmonella osteomyelitis in a sickle cell patient, which usually occurs in the long bones. It's hematogenous osteo osteomyelitis. So you might get a question related to that on the boards. Uh, the general recommendation is to avoid reptiles in a home with kids who are under eight or anyone who is at high risk, in one of those high-risk categories. Treatment. Uh, re it's recommended that if there are no symptoms, it's uncomplicated, you're not in a high-risk category, you don't necessarily require treatment, um, all because, mostly because antibi historically antibiotic therapy can prolong the stool carriage for a couple of months, but with the newer antibiotics that may be less likely, particularly the quinolones. Uh, if you are in a higher risk category or you are symptomatic, you can use um, ciprofloxacin for five days or ampicillin intravenously for a week if very ill, uh, azithromycin uh, orally, uh, one gram then 500 milligrams a day for seven days. Uh, if you're in a high risk group then, or you have bacteremia, then it's recommended to treat it longer for 14 days. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, and I'm going to pick it up next time from here. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? You don't necessarily treat carriers unless they're perhaps in a high-risk group. It's not routinely recommended to treat colonization. Um, uh, certainly there are, are going to be patients who may be severely immunosuppressed or around someone who's immunosuppressed, but if it's not Salmonella typhi, uh, you generally don't treat those patients. Any comments from Dr. Green? That's a very good comment that Dr. Green brings up. Uh, one of uh, there is a, one of the board uh, questions may refer as in treating a, a salmonella carrier that the gallbladder may be a source of chronic colonization. So the treatment may be cholecystectomy in that situation.
Dr. Green also brings up the, the common scenario of, of how do you get your kid back into daycare when they have a communicable disease. And in the case of salmonella um, infection, they can't return to daycare until their stools are clear. And there is uh, data to support treating with azithromycin for that purpose. Thank you very much.